You are listening to the Examine Life with Bram Levinson. So I am back in Montreal. I am back to my little cozy closet recording studio. And uh, here we are. We're still here. I wanted to talk about something today that seems to come up over and over and over again, not only in my own life, but in the lives of the people who I coach and who I mentor. And I just generally see it, well, I suspect that I'm seeing it instigating behaviors in people around me, people not necessarily in proximity to me, but that I'm seeing in the media and and just generally in the world. There's this concept in the wellness community of personal power. Personal power is basically just one's ability to be one's self unapologetically and to just go out into the world and and just be authentic and not try to uh, dumb oneself down or, you know, sandpaper the edges so that they may be a little bit or a little less abrasive. Uh, to really just be able to go out into whatever life is for for each of us and to to just, you know, be ourselves and to not feel like we have to apologize for it or change it or fix it. Uh, Personal power is something that I think we are all born with. I think that we're born with the ability to assert ourselves. We are born with the ability to ask for what we want. And... As we grow older and as we slowly get conditioned to life by the people who raise us and by the environments that we are raised in and the cultures that we are raised in, uh, that personal power either gets magnified, we start to uh, get an excess of it where we start to be very demanding and very very assertive, almost over-assertive, and start to almost be militant, Uh, or that personal power can get taken from us if someone tries to control us. And generally speaking, as children, that's all that is being done, right? We are being uh, asked to adhere to a structure that is imposed on us by adults and by the people who are raising us and by our educational systems and our legal systems. So we have to learn how to conform and how to, you know, have that personal power taken from us. Um... It can also be taken from us by people who try to hurt us, who take away our innate sense of hope and our innate naivete that I think we're all born with. And that that naivete basically has us believing that we are safe in the world and that everything will be okay. And I don't want to insinuate that things won't be okay, but... Every one of us as a child will go through a moment where we realize that life can be dangerous, that our parents are fallible, that something can happen to them. Because as children, we believe that we are protected by our parents and that, there, for me anyway, there was this unspoken assumption that my parents were untouchable. And I think that the, the second suffering enters into the equation for the first time as a child, uh, that's when... So almost like a Pandora's box gets opened and we start to realize that there are many evils that are not only out there but that can get to us. We are fallible, we are human, life is not fair, that kind of thing. So again, we are born with this ability to assert ourselves. In many cases, life will take that power from us and all of a sudden leave us in a place where we are afraid, right? The opposite of personal power is fear. And so if we are afraid, we are rendered impotent, we are rendered silent, we are rendered stationary because something has happened that has taken away that impetus that we had to assert ourselves, to ask for what we want, because we've gotten hurt. And because that happened when we were simply coasting through life, assuming everything was good, it changes how we see life. We no longer coast through life seeing everything as good and everything as possible, and we are afraid that something like that might happen again. And so that power has been taken from us. Now, we can also give away that power. Very often, as I, as I mentioned before, you know, parents raise us and, and educational systems ask us to adhere to whatever their structures are. 
And so we willingly go along with those processes and we give away our personal power. We can also give away our personal power to people. We can give away that power by allowing ourselves to be controlled by somebody in a relationship, uh, in friendships even. And sometimes we give away that personal power thinking that we are doing something good. Many of us are people pleasers and we want other people to be happy and we think that our happiness is contingent on theirs. If everybody else is happy, I'm happy. And so we don't ask for what we want and we don't talk about our own experiences. We don't share what's going on with us, especially our problems, because we don't want to burden anybody else. We give away our ability to uh, be counted, to stand up and be counted, and to be equally as important as the others around us and the other people who are in our environments. We prioritize their experiences over our experiences. So just to summarize quickly, uh, personal power is something that we're all born with, and we either maintain it, and sometimes it can get a little excessive, but nonetheless, we are, I guess, armored with it, um, or rather armed with it. I shouldn't say armored with it, but we're armed with it, uh, or it's something that gets taken from us, or it's something that we give away. This idea of personal power, this concept of personal power, comes up for almost every single one of us, because most of us walk around with some sort of limiting belief that we are not good enough. And good enough is an umbrella term. It can be we're not fast enough or we're not intelligent enough or, or, or rich enough or funny enough. And I've spoken about this before in previous episodes. But nonetheless, most people walk around with a limiting belief, a belief that limits what we each believe is possible for each of ourselves, how capable we are, uh, how powerful, potent we are. These beliefs have us convinced that we are less than, that we are inferior somehow. And so that power that we innately had uh, gets taken. And sometimes these limiting beliefs are handed over to us because someone says something to us or, or insinuates something towards us about ourselves. Somebody says, you know, makes a, a, an off-the-cuff comment about how, I don't know, you look great, did you lose weight? And so all of a sudden you go through life thinking that if you weigh a little bit more, then you don't look as good. Then you're less valuable if you weigh more. Um, or somebody can just say, you know, what are you wearing? That's really ugly. And then all of a sudden you go through life second-guessing what you're wearing. And, and it's no longer an authentic expression, right? So this is, this is where our power uh, has been taken. And we sort of give it away because we agree that whatever someone said to us is true. We believe it to be true, and then we start to react to it by either, you know, starving ourselves so that we don't gain weight or changing the way we dress or whatever. All of a sudden, that authentic expression is not an authentic expression. If most of us are walking around with this limiting belief that somehow we're not enough of something, then personal power for each of us is... I mean, I'm not really crazy about the term personal power, but I mean, it is what it is. I think that personal power is really more personal permission and personal courage to jump beyond whatever that limiting belief is about ourselves and just see how capable we are, just see how capable you are, um, so that you can test those beliefs. You can test to see, you know, number one, just how wrong they are, how false they are, how untrue they are, um, but you can jump beyond them to see that they actually uh, don't really serve you. You know, and, and, and ultimately we've been paying attention to these beliefs that are not based in truth. But yet they've been keeping us from feeling powerful and feeling confident and being able to go out into the world and make the most of the time that we have. Because that's what this is all about. It's about making the most of this time that we are blessed with because this time is a non-renewable resource. Okay, this minute, you're never going to get back. So I hope you like what you're listening to. <laughs> um... What does it look like? What does it look like when someone doesn't believe that they're good enough? What happens when you don't believe that you're going to be accepted for who you are, as you are, without feeling the need to tweak or change anything? What does it look like? Well, for some people, it means that they stay in relationships that they shouldn't be staying in, but it's easier to stay than to leave. So people who stay in friendships and in intimate relationships and those friendships and intimate relationships essentially are not 
positive, they're not helpful, they're toxic, and in some cases, actually harmful. Well, staying in those relationships basically means that one doesn't have the sense of confidence and the sense of hope and the sense of self-worth to extract oneself from the situation uh, for whatever reason. Some people don't believe that they're going to be able to meet anybody else. Some people don't believe that they're going to find other friends. Some people don't believe that they deserve anything better. And some people may have always had patterns of relationships that are similar to the relationship that they're in currently that is toxic, that is harmful. And so if it is familiar, if we have always been in relationships where we have sort of been treated unfairly, we will seek out more relationships in which we will be treated unfairly because the human brain seeks out stability, right? We like things that are certain in a world that is uncertain. And so for people who are used to being treated badly, they will continue to be treated badly because they know it. On some level, it releases stuff in the pleasure centers of the brain so that, you know, they're good. They're good. To strive for something better is more threatening because it's a change. So better the devil you know, right? So for some people, it means staying in relationships that they should be leaving. Other people who don't feel like they are enough, where their personal power is compromised, very often are going to exaggerate, especially when they tell stories. Because think about it. If one doesn't believe that one is good enough or whatever, valid enough, interesting enough, whatever, then whatever stories someone says that comes from like you know their own experiences, uh, they're not going to believe that that story is interesting enough because inherently they don't believe that they are interesting enough. And so especially in a social environment, they'll tell these stories and start to fudge details or start to exaggerate details because if they're not interesting enough, then their story's not interesting enough. And if their story's not interesting enough, well, then we better make it interesting enough. So all of a sudden, you know, thrown in drama gets added into the story because the person who's telling it believes that that makes it more interesting and by default, because it's their story, it makes them more interesting. So what we also learn is that when someone walks out into the world operating from their limiting beliefs, they want to somehow be proven or they want to somehow be shown that those limiting beliefs are not actually true. And so these limiting beliefs, in many cases, instigate the behaviors that are begging to disprove the belief. So... What I'm talking about is if someone doesn't believe that they are smart enough, let's say intelligent enough, very often they're going to go overboard and start to get involved in conversations about stuff that is highly intellectual or highly specific. And listen, maybe they know what they're talking about and they just want to have a conversation like that. And most people who get involved in the conversation won't understand or won't be able to relate to the topic. And so that person feels like, okay, I am smart enough. Um, Or that person is going to start getting involved in a conversation about a topic that is highly intellectual, but not really knowing everything about that topic. And then all of a sudden gets caught in this loop where, you know, they're stuck talking about this, this topic, but they don't really know what they're talking about. And that's when ego gets involved, because then people start to argue about, you know, what's right and what's wrong when they don't really have anything to back up this argument. You know, I know I've gotten involved in many a conversation in past incarnations of my life where I was talking about shit I didn't, I hadn't, I knew nothing about. I had overheard something. I had seen a headline. I thought I had an opinion based on the limited knowledge that I had. And then when I actually got into a conversation with someone who knew what they were talking about because I didn't want to look stupid in the context of that conversation. Instead of saying, oh, you know what, you must be right, I don't know enough about this, instead of being that honest, um, I would just start to defend whatever my my, my uh, viewpoint was, my perspective was, and start to get into an argument about, an argument about it, about who was right, you know. And ultimately, I didn't care. I didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't even care. You know, it's amazing what the what the ego sort of instigates us to do. So for someone who feels, you know, less than, very often what they can end up doing or what will manifest is exaggerating details when they start to tell stories. Now, something that I have noticed in the recent past, and I keep seeing it over and over and over again, and I see it manifesting in different ways, 
is that another way that people overcompensate for what they believe they lack is they amplify. They amplify uh, behaviors. They amplify uh, certain aspects of their personalities that don't need to be amplified. But I guess they believe that if they just showed up the way they are, for, they would somehow be rejected or it somehow wouldn't be good enough. So sometimes that amplification happens with arrogance. Sometimes people come out into the world and they just start acting like they own everything, that they are entitled to everything, that, you know, everything is theirs for the taking, the world is their oyster. And and there's a sense of entitlement and a sense of expectation. And so, you know, it could be... uh, inappropriate behavior with other people, especially of the opposite sex or the same sex, depending on what their sexual orientation is, because that gives them a sense of power. For some people, it's just wanting to look like they are, you know, quote unquote, the man or the woman, meaning, uh, you know, you walk into a restaurant and everybody knows you at the restaurant and they welcome you and you don't need a reservation. Or, you know, no matter where you go, people welcome you, they slap you on the back, they bring you to your table, you know, like like you're the king of the castle type thing. King, what was that thing from, from Titanic? I'm, I, I forget. I mean, listen, that goes to show how often I've seen that movie. Um, so sometimes it manifests as arrogance. Sometimes it, it, and it, it, it manifests rather as false confidence. So people uh, puffed up with pride. You actually see it in their posture. You see the chest coming out and the shoulders coming back, and they walk around like peacocks displaying their feathers. Uh, You will see this if you go downtown, if you live in an urban area. Go downtown on a Saturday night. You're going to see a lot of posturing. It's a lot of false confidence. It's a lot of people going out thinking, oh, okay, good, this is the way I should look. I've got... My, you know, I've got my, 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 my slap on for, for those of you who don't know what that is in, in Britain, slap on is like women who put their makeup on. So I've got my slap on, um, you know, the guys are all dressed, the women are all dressed, the heels are high, um, and everybody's acting like they're, you know, the center of the world, that they're in their own reality show that, you know, they're going to be photographed in a who wore it better kind of situation. Um, so that like overt confidence sometimes I think, is sort of an indication of uh, feeling less than. Sometimes it's overt politeness and almost militant manners. So people who are very, very, very careful. So instead of it being excessive, instead of the way they, 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 this um, lack of confidence manifests in an excessive way, it can also manifest in like a deficient way where they start to withdraw a little bit. They're very, very polite, very careful with their words, um, and very careful with their manners, very careful not to offend anybody, not to upset any norms, whether they be societal, cultural, religious. Um, and sometimes you'll find people who just shut down and close down and they become silent and they become mute uh, and they withdraw. And again, you can also see this in their physicality. You can see this in the way that they stand. Very often their shoulders will round forward and the center of their chest will cave in, like they're almost protecting the center of the heart, um, or the center of the chest. So for people who, you know, are feeling like there is some room for personal power to to grow, uh, their behaviors can, I don't know, become amplified. Um, and sometimes, listen, sometimes we're a little bit of all of those things. Sometimes we rotate from one to the other, depending on the situation, depending on where we are and how we feel about ourselves. Because listen, nothing is ever one thing. We don't go through life always thinking that we are, you know, less than or okay or greater than. Uh, in different instances, we will feel differently. However, very often we go from one to the other. Um, I also feel like whenever, you know, I've got a lot of female friends and when there are events that these female friends go to or and that I'm a part of anyway so that I can be witness to it, I feel like one of the ways that uh, they also make up for what they believe they lack is with makeup. And I referred to getting your slap on a couple of minutes ago. Um, I al- almost always, in 99.9% of the time, I feel that at least the women I know and love, that they look better without makeup than when they put makeup on. I find that 
the women in my life put on too much makeup. I think that they feel they, the need to do this whole thing. It's almost like a like a fucking YouTube makeup tutorial where, you know, the foundation is on and the blush is on and the eyeshadow is on and the eyeliner is on and the lip whatever is on. Um, and all of a sudden, it's like you can almost peel off this mask. Do you know what I mean? And I can't see my friends. I can't see them. And I just find like it's just too much. And so I have gotten very good at saying it and not not saying it in an accusatory way, but telling my friends, look, you look better without it. You need to trust me. And listen, I don't have a vested interest in it. I don't care. I'm a gay guy. I'm, you know, I'm not looking at them thinking, you know, like oh, I want to get with that. But I'm looking at them thinking if they're putting on this makeup to look good, to enhance what they already have, there's a difference between enhancing their facial characteristics and their their physiognomy. There's a difference between doing that and completely covering it up so that you end up looking like someone else, looking like a Kardashian or looking for like 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 what you think you need to look like. And I'm only using the Kardashian reference because I mean it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous already. We're all learning to like just clone ourselves that we look like each other. We're not supposed to look like each other. We are supposed to be individuals. We are not all supposed to have long, dark hair. We're not all supposed to have like mouths that look like they're about to or lips that look like they're about to explode. I'm not interested in a fucking smoky eye. I don't care. I want all of us to look like ourselves. I want all of us to feel like we can be ourselves. There is no reason why we need to like cover the way we look up in order to be accepted societally. If you are hanging out with people who think that you don't look good enough until you do that, then you need to hang out with different people. You need to remove yourself from your situations and your friendships and understand that it's time for you to reclaim some of your personal power because this shit is not on. And if you can't tell, it really bothers me. (laughs) And it bothers me, I guess, because it, it triggers something in me probably from my childhood, where I didn't believe that I could simply be myself in the world as a gay kid when I didn't see myself reflected back to me in my environment, in my family, in media, in culture. So listen, I've come a long way. I've come to, I almost went, you know, full excessive on the on the other side of the spectrum where I was like, this is me. I don't care if you like it, tough shit. I'm somewhere more towards a middle ground at this point in my life. But I do believe that my experience is not meant to be relegated solely to my experience. It's not meant to be kept to me. I'm supposed to share it uh, so that we can find commonality. And also, listen, I think that the experience of not feeling like you fit into the world is, is, is a common experience. And I think if we're going to get over that, if we're going to start to become more comfortable with ourselves so we can go into any situation, any environment, and be who we are and feel confident about that and not give a second thought to people who challenge it, then I think we have to be very, very honest with ourselves about how we ourselves are transforming who and how we are to fit uh, an expectation. The only standard that we need to live up to is our own, for ourselves. And we need to be real about what that standard is. The easiest thing in the world is to let go of all of the defenses and all of the games and simply be ourselves. I say it's one of the easiest things in the world to do. However, because we don't see it being done around us, presents itself as being one of the hardest things to do. I want you to trust me. It is one of the easiest things to do. It starts by allowing yourself to simply be yourself. Give yourself permission to be who you are, to be how you are. There's nothing to change. There's nothing to fix. There's nothing to transform. Forget about the smoky eye. We don't care. You look better without it. And I don't mean that just for women. I'm t- I, it, it's, I, you know, it's symbolic, Okay. Um, I think we need to get out of harmful situations and environments like abusive relationships, like exploitive friendships, like jobs that drain our hope and deplete our energy. Okay, And that means that we have to trust that if we remove ourselves from this situation, we will be able to find better situations. That's a big ask. A lot of people believe that you know the world is not a safe place. They're not good enough to be able to, to, to make all these things manifest. Listen, I know that spiritually speaking, these things will only come to pass when we do the work that is our work to do. And for every single one of us that can identify an environment or a situation that we are involved in that is not helpful or healthy, 
then the work is to extract yourself. And then see what comes to you. We typically stay in situations because we don't believe we deserve better. We don't believe we can get anything or anyone better. We can. You can. You will. You've made it this far. There are certain things that we know about life. We'll find another job. We'll find another partner. As long as we set our intention and we do the work. Let yourself relax. Be however you want to be without feeling that you need to be anything else, anything other than you in that moment. Listen, yes, you know, in certain environments, we need to put on our best face and put our best foot forward. But let's make sure that's our best, our best, not the best that we think someone else is going to be happy by. We don't get leaders, okay, in our culture and in our environments. uh, We don't get them by those people trying to acquiesce to everyone else's expectations. We get leaders because those leaders are unequivocally themselves. They are confidently themselves. They are unapologetically themselves. And yes, when we do that, of course we're going to be the target of certain people's animosity because there are people out there who would like to feel that free and would like to give themselves that freedom, but they don't believe that they can. So when they see someone else do it, they want to tear that person down because if I can't do it, how dare you do it? You know what? Shit happens. If it's going to happen... Identify it when it happens. Don't take it personally. It has nothing to do with you. Go around those people, go over, under, through those people, but just move past them. Okay, there is no time to spend on the haters or on the naysayers. Keep going. Ultimately, what we learn spiritually is all of these assumptions and beliefs that we're not enough are false. We learn that we need to start to, as my friend Sean constantly says, we need to dismantle these limiting beliefs. We need to understand them. We need to understand how they have motivated us into the world up until this point. And we need to understand how to no longer give them importance. We need to understand how we have been in relationship to personal power. We need to each understand whether or not we have given that personal power away, whether it has been taken, or whether we have let it lie dormant because we were afraid to exercise it. Every single one of us has the ability to stand up in our own lives and be ourselves. And as I've said before, and to quote Martha Graham, there is only one of you in all of time. I want you to consider that. There is only one of you in all of time. That in itself is mind-blowingly crazy miraculous. It's beautiful. There's only one of you in all of time, which means there's only one of your voice. That means that there's only one of your expression. It means that you are bringing something to the world that the world doesn't have and won't have if your uncertainty and insecurity keeps you from being you and doing you and following the intuitive urges that are motivating you to move in specific directions. This is your spiritual path. Those urges, those directions are yours to pursue. You have dreams, they're yours. Yours specifically. You don't have the same dreams I have, and I don't have the same dreams you have. So I believe it's our responsibility to get out of our own way, as my teacher Joan Ravinsky told me 20 years ago. It's up to us to get out of our own way to understand that no one else is preventing us from standing up in our own lives with confidence, with certainty, with like Game of Thrones fury. No one's standing in our own way except us. So what are you waiting for? You waiting for someone to hold your hand doing it? Listen, that's not going to happen. This path that we are on, yes, occasionally we will have people accompanying us so that, you know, it's not as grueling, it's a little less threatening. But ultimately, for every single one of us, it is the path for one. It is the path of one. And sometimes we have to take those steps ourselves. I am telling you that no matter what you do in your life, you will be fine. I am telling you that no matter what decisions you make, Everything will work out. So regardless of whether you take the chance or not, you're going to be fine. So why wouldn't you take the chance to be more clearly you so that we can see you, so that we can understand you, so that we can have you in the world to inspire us so that there's more of all this beauty and this greatness and this daring? What are you waiting for? Think about it. I'll see you later.
This has been the Examine Life with Bram Levinson.